going to move on and introduce um, Maggie um, and Jill Crichton. And Maggie needs no introduction, um, I don't think at all. She has, I think, unrivaled even legendary status, should I say, amongst um, care experts. I think her huge wealth of an experience of organizing and managing care and case management is really sort of un unrivaled. I think you probably appear, Maggie, as an expert witness and uh, more maximum severity uh, medico legal cases than most barristers, I think. And uh, on top of the lifetime achievement awards and all your charitable work, um, it's a true, truly incredible legacy. And Jill, very glad to have you um, with us as well. Um, you've been immersed in all matters occupational therapy since uh, 2009. You've got an amazing clinical as well as medico legal practice. Um, you've been heavily involved in setting up and developing local authority practices, uh, regular supervisor, trainer, speaker. Uh, so in short, I think you know everything there is to know about occupational therapy matters. And, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your, your double act. So over to you, Maggie and Jill. Thank you, Elliot. Um, and thank you, everybody, for staying the course, because it's a long day today. I mean, it started at half past one. And that's why Jill and I thought we'd do something different. Jill is one of our associates who was working with us um, before she had her injury. And she'll be talking you through her journey. And I think in the light of what we just heard about those two fundamental dishonesty claims, I think it will be interesting to hear from Jill really the other side of the coin, just what the difficulties are from somebody who hasn't got a claim. She just wants to continue educating people, um, supporting them and telling her story. So that's what she's going to do. We'll do a little bit of a question and answer because there's a few things that are going to come out of Jill's talk that I'd like to raise. And I'll do a couple of things at the end, if there's time, um, just talking about the recruitment crisis, which, as you're all aware, is hitting hard at the moment and will be hitting hard even um, in where there's less hours, which obviously there are with the court equina than there are in certain other cases. Anyway, over to Jill. Hello, Maggie. Hello, everybody. Um, to give you a little bit of background, um, well, you've already had a little bit, but a little more. I had a lot of experience of working with children and adults before I started my occupational therapy training. And as you've heard, since qualifying, I've worked in several roles with local authorities, um, with an equipment service, and in presenting and running workshops at conferences. So I've gained quite a lot of experience. I started doing private work in 2018, and I started working with Maggie as an associate in 2019. I was fit and active. I enjoyed traveling all over the country in the course of my work. I travelled a lot by motorcycle with my long-term partner. I enjoyed walking, gardening, and I have my own woodwork shed. On the 4th of June last year, my day started normally. Although I had had a very small numb patch on my right hip for the previous 24 hours, which didn't really seem of any consequence. However, within two hours of getting up, I completely lost the use of both legs and developed urinary retention. And my very first thought was that I had cordial equina syndrome. I was familiar with this condition because I recently completed two OT expert witness assessments for people with the condition. I was taken to hospital. I had a catheter, an MRI scan, and cordial equina was ruled out. I was transferred to Southampton General Neuro Ward, where I had numerous scans, x-rays, lumbar puncture, daily blood tests, and I was eventually diagnosed with transverse myelitis and given a three-day intensive course of IV steroids. Transverse myelitis is a condition that causes an inflammation around the spine and can, but not always, result in permanent damage to the sheath surrounding the spinal cord. It only affects about 300 people a year in the UK, and it can be caused by infections, virus, vaccination, or an autoimmune response. And all of those were ruled out in my case. For me, it's no known cause, so I'm really unlucky. The symptoms that I have are actually very similar indeed to that of cordial equina. 
So after a week, I was transferred to Winchester Hospital. I spent five weeks waiting for a rehab bed. I couldn't go home because I couldn't walk. And my house is not in the least bit wheelchair friendly. I did start to walk while I was in Winchester, but it was very limited. And I really wouldn't have been able to manage at all at home. I moved to Salisbury Spinal Unit in mid-July. I spent a week in isolation, which I wouldn't recommend to anyone. And then I was moved on to the main part of the unit. But being in a spinal unit rather than a general rehab unit was really important to me. I was with people who had similar conditions and a very good understanding of their fellow patients' problems and needs. And it meant that my rehab was really very focused on spinal injury. And so I had relevant treatment. I was also very fortunate while I was in the unit to become part of a social group that met in the garden every evening after tea. We'd occasionally smuggle in bottles of wine or beer. Um, and sometimes we'd book taxis and go off to the pub. And we'd discuss our various problems. Because we were all pretty much in the same boat, there was no embarrassment about discussing really personal issues. So it was all really very helpful. And we actually continued to have the WhatsApp group and keep in touch regularly. I felt that the success of rehab is really dependent on attitude and engagement. For myself, I was really determined that I would walk out of the spinal unit unaided and I would do everything in my power to achieve that goal. I know some patients would never walk again due to their injuries, but there were some who, who probably could have walked but were prevented by their attitude and degree of engagement. And as a result, they left in a wheelchair. I was actually known by many of the staff as their DIY patient, as I wouldn't let any of them do anything for me that I could do for myself. Uh, my treatment consisted of medication. I was on gabapentin, baclofen and amitriptyline. And it was actually suggested quite a few times that that should be increased. But I was really resistant to this. And I, I continue to detest being dependent on medication. I had one-to-one -one physiotherapy twice a week and one-to-one -one hydrotherapy each week. I had access to a gym on the unit every evening as well as access to the staff swimming pool and gym as often as, as I wanted. And if at any time there was no gym or swimming available, then I would be in the corridor doing exercises using the handrail for support. My rehab was focused on mostly walking and balance. I did have two kitchen assessments, firstly cooking a meal whilst I was in my wheelchair, and secondly, making a cup of tea once I was able to walk a little with the aid of a stick. And I was also assessed going into town by bus in my wheelchair and doing some shopping. And unfortunately that was successful and I was then allowed to go out with others or on my own. And after 12 weeks, I was able to walk out of the unit unaided. And then once home, I think really once home, the real rehab started. I had to learn ways of doing household tasks of managing work and of getting out of the house. And there are things I really can't do. Anything that involves bending down or reaching up or out of the question, carrying things up and down stairs is a bit problematic. I can't manage the garden. I've had to buy long handled things like dustpan and brush, dusters, window squeegee. Um, I still need help. Um, I do have someone who comes for an afternoon every so often and it does the jobs I can't manage. Driving is a really big issue for me. I can't drive because I have to surrender my driving license due to my medical condition. I live in a very rural area with a limited bus service. I can't walk to the bus service, though, bus stop, though it's too far. I surrendered my license in November last year. Um, DVLA wrote to my doctor at the spinal unit in March, and after numerous phone calls from me to the spinal unit, I finally been advised that my information has now been sent to the DVLA. That's eight months so far. And now I have to wait for DVLA, who apparently have long delays due to COVID. So goodness knows when I'll get my driving license back. 
I need to have a driving assessment because I can't use foot pedals safely due to loss of proprioception and altered sensations in my feet. I can't have an assessment locally because I need a full licence. They do assessments on the public highway. So I'm going to have to go to Car Sholton, which is 70 miles away. And that means I'm going to have to ask my partner to take time off work to take me. And in the meantime, I'm totally dependent on the local volunteer taxi service, the community bus and the kindness of my family and friends for anything other than going to the village, which is half a mile away. I bought a basic scooter, something that I was initially totally opposed to. But it does mean that I can get to the shop, to the hairdressers and the surgery independently. The journey to the village is extremely uncomfortable because the pavements around here are shocking and the constant vibration and bumping increases nerve pain. But I do have independence or some independence as a result of the scooter and that's really important to my mental well-being. Being dependent on others when you've been fiercely independent all your life is really difficult to adjust to. So I continue to work on my walking because I'm a bit unsteady and I can't walk very far. I find walking on uneven ground really difficult. I have problems with both legs, but my right leg is far worse. I've got nerve pain and patches of numbness and loss of proprioception. I've got altered sensations in the soles of my feet. Feels like I'm standing barefoot on gravel and I don't know, electric cables. And after about half an hour, it gets really painful. I have hip, knee and ankle pain, which can vary in intensity. This all affects my ability to walk. I have to really focus and concentrate when I'm walking. Like I can't look around me. I can't look at the scenery. I have to constantly check the ground to see where I'm putting my feet. And I have to think about where my legs and feet are and what they're doing. It's exhausting. I've got hypersensitivity in my right thigh, which has affected what I can wear. Um, I used to wear jeans and trousers, sometimes long skirts, but the feel of the fabric brushing against my legs is too painful to bear. And so now I wear leggings um, and the fabric grips and moves with my leg rather than the fabric moving against my leg. I have to wear leggings at night as well, which I hate, especially in hot weather. Now, I can't bear the feel of the sheets brushing against my leg. That's just too painful too. I also have saddle anaesthesia, and that causes numbness and discomfort across my buttocks. So I can't sit for very long at a time. It, in fact, sitting is just really uncomfortable anyway. I can't sit on a hard surface for more than a couple of minutes as it gets far too painful. So I've now bought a lovely inflatable cushion that I can roll up put in my bag and I take it out with me just in case there's nowhere comfortable as I can sit. So I, I live with pain of some sort every waking moment and the pain gets much worse in damp or wet weather. Um, the only time it doesn't hurt is when I'm asleep. It's just exhausting. I also have spasms in my legs. Usually in the evening when I'm relaxing or during the night, and these are really uncomfortable and at times can be very painful, especially my right ankle. I think it's to do with the way my ankle twists when the muscles contract. I've not found any way really of managing these. The worst spasm is always when I first wake up. As soon as I move any part of my body, even a little, even just doing that, I have one really big spasm which will affect my entire lower body and my back. And that one's really painful. So really not a great way to start the day. I have bowel problems and have to take laxatives every day, but I still get constipated at times. Um, the constipation can cause an increase in nerve pain. So it's really important that I keep this under control. I have um, coctalgia, which is spasms of the anal sphincter. And that's incredibly uncomfortable. And it just makes me feel like I need to dash to the toilet. Uh, it increases when I'm constipated. And it really affects me if I'm out, as I always, always need to know where the nearest toilet is. 
it's that first thing I do when I go somewhere new, I check where the toilet is. The constipation and tiredness increase spasms and nerve pain, and that can make sleep difficult, which, of course, increases tiredness and fatigue, and then you have that spiral. Increased fatigue makes everything, walking, washing and dressing, those personal activities and the domestic activities, along with con concentration, a lot more difficult. Managing the nerve pain and spasms is really hard. I still take medication. I take the gabapentin, amitriptyline and baclofen. I hate taking it. But it's really hard to find a balance between managing the pain with the medication and managing the side effects. I have tried some alternative treatments, but without much success. I've tried CBD oil and full spectrum cannabis gummies and lotion. And with all of these, it's really difficult to know how much to take and how long to use them before giving up. They're not regulated. And knowing what dosage to take is really difficult. I wasn't happy with the side effects of the full spectrum products and the CBD oil, CBD oil didn't seem to have any effect at all. So gave up on all those, but I'm about to start a course of acupuncture if I've been advised that this might be helpful. Worth a try. Alongside my medication, I do a lot of exercise at home. Um, repetitive exercise can help reduce nerve pain eventually. So I bought a mini bike and a treadmill, and I use each of these for up to half an hour a day. And I have a floor mat, which I do stretches and Pilates exercises on probably four or five times a week for uh, up to 45 minutes. And I go to hydrotherapy for an hour every week. I love hydrotherapy. I think it's wonderful. I'm really, really fortunate. There's a good hydrotherapy pool locally, which is supported by the Pinder Trust. Uh, it's a charity that subsidises hydrotherapy treatment in Hampshire, and it makes it much more affordable. I go with Hobbs Rehabilitation, who've got excellent physiotherapists and are really helpful. The warm water helps my body and muscles relax which can help heal injuries, but it also promotes bodily functions like circulation, respiration, and can provide pain relief, and it can improve standing, balance, and walking. Well, I can certainly do things in the pool that I can't do on land. In the pool, I can hop, skip, and jump. Excuse me. I can stand on my right leg and balance on it. If I tried any of those things on land, I'd fall over. I know that if I can do these things in the water, that eventually I'll be able to do them on land. So doing a range of exercises and walking practice in the pool has really helped me gain confidence. When I first get into the pool, the movement of the water against my leg causes pain in the hypersensitive areas. But after a while, that pain will reduce. There's a growing evidence base that suggests that introducing heat will numb or override the sensation of pain, making it easier to move and exercise more easily. And that certainly seems to be the case for me. I really can't express enough how beneficial hydrotherapy is. It's definitely helped me build strength and confidence. When I started, I was in my wheelchair and only able to walk a very short distance with a stick or walking frame. To start with, after the sessions, I'd feel really tired. I'd have poor sleep because the pain and spasms would increase and my legs would just feel really horrible the next day. But after a while, after sessions, I started feeling good. I had no increase in pain and spasms, so I still do find it tiring. I've been going for about seven months now and hydrotherapy still helps me. And actually now I can leave my wheelchair at home when I go. I can't work as I used to, sadly. I can work from home all the time now. I've got a good office set up in a bedroom and it's also where my treadmill and floor mat are. That's my treadmill over there behind me and my floor mat over there, which you can't see. So when I get too uncomfortable sitting, which can happen pretty frequently, I'll get on the treadmill for a few minutes and at the end of my working day, I'll get down on the mat and do those stretches. I 
I'm a part-time locum contract with Reading Borough Council at the moment doing care package reviews over the telephone and I'm working on a couple of projects around improving their work processes and I also continue to do expert witness assessments remotely. I've never really been keen on this method of assessment but I am actually finding now that it's working very well in particular with those cases where the person has similar symptoms and issues to me. Because I really understand the complexity of such cases, I'm living it myself. I found as well that once the client realizes that I really do understand their problems, as I have similar, they're much more likely to open up and talk more. And as a result, I feel that I can produce a better and much more reliable report when I do start visiting in around September, I will need a driver if I haven't got my license back. To I'd need to be able to park close to the house so I don't have to walk too far. I'd need an accessible toilet. And I would actually need to be able to record the assessment rather than take notes because I can't rest a notebook on my lap um, because of the hypersensitivity in my legs. It would be painful. The weather actually would affect my ability to assess somebody, to complete an assessment, because my pain would be much worse. I'd be more uncomfortable. In terms of my leisure activities, I really have very limited ability to carry out my leisure activities. They're much more affected by my disability than domestic tasks and work tasks and work. I can't get on a motorbike. And even if I could, I wouldn't be safe because I wouldn't know where my right foot in particular was. It could easily slip off the foot peg without me realising. So I've actually bought a sidecar with a little door and I can get in and out of that though with a bit of a struggle. And my partner can take me out for short distances. It's not quite the same, it's close. And the, the vibrations though, and lack of decent suspension do trigger the nerve pain. So it's definitely only short distances. Uh, in my shed doing woodwork, I'm limited really to a maximum of an hour because the soles of my feet have just become far too painful. I've got a stool, but I also find that too uncomfortable to sit on. I really need to look for something, something better to sit on. I can't go for walks and I can't do my garden. And sadly, I can't go on holiday unless someone takes me because I can't drive. I can't carry bags. I can't sit for very long without getting really uncomfortable. I have to stand up every so often. I really, really wouldn't be able to manage in a confined space in economy class on an aeroplane. And once I got somewhere, I'd have real difficulty on uneven surfaces like cobble streets. And in a hotel, if it was a bar, I wouldn't be able to get in and out of it. I'd need to have a shower. And I'd always need to make sure that I had a cushion to sit on in a dining area or a restaurant. It would just be all too problematic. And something that I, I really try to avoid thinking about is the mental impact of all of this. I am by nature a cheerful person. My partner has often found me exasperatingly so, apparently. He says I'm relentlessly cheerful used to be. Now I'm actually more depressed and frustrated and cheerful. I do have a chance of making a full recovery eventually, but it can be really hard to be positive all the time. I've never been off of counselling of any sort. I do my best not to give in, but sometimes I do when it all gets a bit hard and I'll have a good cry. Um, so my disability has had such a huge effect on my entire life affected every single thing I do and it's the hardest thing I've ever had to deal with. Everything I do, even really simple tasks, just like washing up, requires such a great deal of effort and just leaves me exhausted at the end of the day. That's me. Jill, thank you. Um, thank you very much because it's tough going through your journey like that, I know. But... Because of where you come from and being a rehab consultant, obviously you've been able to fight, you've been able to push yourself. As you say, you were the do-it-yourself patient. But would you have benefited if you hadn't had that of having a case manager? How would you have coped? 
it would have been very much harder, very much harder indeed. But because I know, I know what equipment's out there, I know what services are out there, I knew how to go about organising hydrotherapy for myself. I knew where to look for equipment that would be helpful to me. Um, I, I'm trained in a way to problem solve. So when I'm faced with a task that's a little bit difficult, I can look at it and work out ways of doing it differently. I suppose I say that because I know within the range of spinal injury, people look at cord equina and they think, well, that's more of a minor disability. You know, somebody can walk. They are able to do their personal care. As you said, you can do some domestic chores, but you need help, obviously, with the majority of it. Um, and I thought it was very interesting when you were saying that it's your hobbies, um, holidays and things mm. that you really need help with. And I think that that's very much something that as a professional, I've found that it's something that's quite often undervalued, just how important that help is. It isn't all about just providing somebody to come in and do the washing up. Although the washing up isn't easy, is it? No, no. Um, I do sometimes think that if I had someone to do the washing up, I might find more energy or better ability to manage some of my leisure tasks, I might be able to spend a little bit longer in the shed because I haven't been doing that standing up, doing the washing up. I can use that standing up in the shed. Well, the other thing is, I mean, that's why you're an, an unusual woman because it's very often young men that I'm talking about motorcycles and um, workshops um, that they can go to. But, I mean, yes, you can do stuff in your shed, but you're not able to do anything that requires any lifting or too much bending. It's very much the small bits of work. Oh, absolutely. You didn't have your job. If that was your sort of vocation as well, you'd have to have help, wouldn't you? Oh, gosh, I would, yes. Definitely. Yeah, there's, there's bits of my shed I can't access. And there's, there's things that I can't reach. I mean, that was the reason that I wanted to really introduce you to Jill today, because um, I spent some time with her and I just found it reaffirmed everything that I knew about what we all try and do with these claims, try to be putting people back where they were and getting the help. Elliot, I think we're probably up on time, but thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. Well, it's been an amazing talk. And I must say, Jill, it's incredible of you to share your personal experience with the whole room effectively of strangers and it really brings home um, how lives can be sort of turned uh, suddenly with no warning and the realities of living with a spinal condition it's very mm. sobering um, but it demonstrates I think your amazing strength of mind and courage and I uh, really wish you all the best and hope okay. you continue to find the, the, the treatments and therapies which will bring you some relief and hopefully um, more than relief going going forward. Um, but uh, no, that was a really wonderful, um, sobering talk. And thank you, Maggie, as ever. Um, maybe just if we can just run one minute over time, Maggie, and just you commented at the beginning as well that you were going to say something about the difficulties at the moment in, in recruitment. Um, and perhaps if you can just give us a little bit of enlightenment as to where we are at the moment on that. Well, I don't think you can overestimate the problem when you look at the government statistics for social care. And we're looking for special people to go and work with our clients, people that can motivate them, can absorb the therapies. And particularly as all of our clients have lost two years, we've all lost two years. I don't know whether you feel like that, Elliot, but <laughs> stuff, stuff that happened in um, 2019, you think, well, that was the other, you know, where was that? Oh, my goodness. Well, when you've had a brain injury or a spinal injury and you've been left for two years, um, particularly those that aren't didn't have acute, but were in the, just starting their rehab at home, um, not having people coming into the home, being on Zoom, the problems just are, there's such a shortage of um, staff at the moment. Um, people are having to stay in the hospital, they shouldn't have to. Um, you know, we are... Rates have gone up, agencies have gone up, literally 25, some of them 25% to 30%. Pay rates are way outstripping inflation and people are still finding that they've got not a 
a whole bunch of applicants, but just a few. And we're not looking for just anybody. We're not looking for the unemployed. We're looking for people who can make a difference. Um, so yes, I mean, I just feel that in every area of spinal injury and with um, someone in um, Jill's situation, you need someone who could drive, you need somebody who's able to put a hand to the things that she wants would want to do. And that sort of person is going to be much more difficult to get hold of and much more expensive. No, absolutely, Maggie. And yes, I think no sooner are the reports written than they're needing to be updated, aren't they? Things are moving so... Well, I write in mind now that I can't guarantee a rate um, any longer than six months due to the unprecedented recruitment crisis. Yeah. Uh, well, Maggie, thank you so much as as ever. And, uh, and a massive thank you to all of our speakers. I know these things always take up an awful lot of time and preparation. Um, so a big thank you to... to John Leach, obviously, who's no longer with us, with uh, Dr. Kumar, Jonathan Han, Daniel, Tom Gibson, um, and to you and Jill, uh, really are hu hugely grateful. Um, and also a particular thank you to Vicky Bunn, who's been doing all of the tech wizardry and helping organize us all, um, hugely appreciated, and to Paul Barton for helping to push this together. And I hope this is part one of, of, of several more. Um, but a big thank you to everyone. I hope you all have a have a wonderful rest of week and a, and a great summer. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye bye.